Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome back to Sex Matters. I'm Dr. Rachel Rubin. I am a urologist with fellowship training in sexual medicine, and I practice in the Washington, D.C. area. I am so thrilled to check out cool sexual medicine headlines, new research, exciting topics in this field, and I'm so thrilled to introduce Dr. Chanel Bowen. Uh, so go ahead, introduce yourself, Dr. Bowen, and then we'll talk about your very exciting research that we just got published. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Rubin. I'm Dr. Chanel Bowen. I'm a second-year postdoc at MIT in the Edelman Lab, and my research primarily focuses on female pelvic anatomy and health, and I'm currently specializing in sexual anatomy and health. And what I love is about your background. Tell everybody what your science background is at MIT. I have a bachelor's and master's in biomedical engineering from UConn, and I recently acquired my PhD in bioengineering from the University of Pittsburgh, where I performed bioimaging analyses of women postoperatively after pelvic organ prolapse surgery and looking at the relationship between anatomy and function in those patients to see if there are anatomical factors associated with functional outcomes. And it's so fabulous. And I'm just so grateful that you are looking at uh, clitoral anatomy because this is a topic that has been really understudied, underlooked at in our anatomy textbooks. There's cl almost nothing on clitoral anatomy, which as we know is the homologue of the penis, which we have lots of research on. So Dr. Bowen just published a fabulous paper in JAMA Surgery called Postoperative Sexual Function After Vaginal Surgery and Clitoral Size, Position, and Shape. Dr. Bowen, why don't you tell us a little bit about what you looked at in this, in this paper? This paper was a supplementary study of a NIH um, national network called the Public Floor Disorders Network, and we had access to images of women um, after prolapse surgery, where I was brought in to segment the uh, 3D clitoral anatomy and correlate it with uh, sexual questionnaires that were obtained um, from the clinical study this data was based on. And we were really looking into whether there was a relationship between anatomy and function in these patients. And it was a really great learning experience before I didn't know what a clitoris looked like. So um, learning what it actually looks like and how it can vary from person to person and seeing how it relates to functional outcomes was really super cool to see. So Dr. Bowen, why don't you take us through what were the different uh, measurements that were looked at and, and take us through this figure? Because it's really, I think a lot of doctors uh, who are watching this don't even know clitoral anatomy and how truly uh, uh, sizable, all the way down to ischial tuberosities, uh, mm -hmm. you know, the, the clitoris goes. I was really inspired by Dr. Vaccaro's work, who previously looked at um, clitoral anatomy from MRI and um, Basically, the, a lot of measurements that were obtained were obtained in 2D. So something that I sought to do was expand the analysis to 3D, and that involved creating a custom program to obtain dimensional measurements of each component of the clitoris. So that's what um, um, part A of this figure is showing uh, by fitting bounding boxes around each structure and looking at the volume enclosed by the 3D models, we can take length, width, and thickness measurements of each clitoral component, such as the glands, body, and cura from um, left to right, and the volume of the vestibular bulbs. And something also cool that hasn't really been described is the position of the clitoris with respect to the bony pelvis. So using an anatomical coordinate system based on the bony landmarks of the pelvis, we can quantify the position of the clitoris um, from person to person in an uh, objective and systemic manner. How easy was it to get these measurements uh, from the MRIs? Is this just an MRI without contrast? Did it have to have contrast? Were there certain sequences that you had to find? These patients had vaginal contrast, and that was to make the vaginal borders easier to see. Um, it didn't really affect with the easiness of seeing the clitoris, but um, it was a pretty simple process of just segmenting the clitoral anatomy um, from axial MRIs, and then defining the anatomical coordinate system was also a pretty easy thing to do. It's just a very long process with the high volume of patients we had access to. 
Tell us more about what it is you found uh, looking at, you looked at quite a few of these MRI studies. The cool things we were able to find in the study was showing how the size of the clitoral glands in particular, which is a very important, crucial uh, component of the clitoral complex, smaller dimensions overall were associated with poor sexual function outcomes among sexually active women. And then something cool that we also were able to find is that among not sexually active women who um, decided after surgery to not engage in sexual activity, the position of the clitoris seemed to matter, where a clitoris that was um, more posterior, so um, further back in the pelvis, and more inferior, so lower in the pelvis, that was um, correlated with like sexual avoidance and dyspareunia, which was pretty interesting. And then lastly, um, I don't think, to my knowledge, clitoral shape has been quantified and Something that was also cool with that is that the hot spots of the color maps we show in our paper were um, the largest shape differences that were observed. Those were um, associated with the attachment sites of clitoral supportive structures like the ischiocavernosis muscles and the clitoral suspensory ligament, which is not really often talked about. So looking into those structures, looking into pelvic bone shape as well, because that can uh, strongly dictate the shape of the clitoris as well. So a lot of avenues to look into um, going forward. For somebody like me who sees sexual dysfunction patients all day, every day, and twice on Sunday, it seems like uh, we have a, a huge need for more objective measures that we can look at and ways that we can track this. Do you see this? You know, I see so many avenues where we need the before images, after image, obviously surgery can change things. We know the penis is a hormone sensitive structure and we know the clitoris is a hormone sensitive structure. So understanding how menopause, how testosterone therapy, how puberty, right? All these things, how they affect clitoral growth. Um, mm -hmm. And then, you know, what affects position? Is it, you know, is it just the luck of the draw? It, it's so fascinating. Where would you like to see the research go from here and how do we get these imaging protocols um, more um, known about uh, uh, nationwide. Something cool that we're looking to go forward with is seeing how the type of prolapse surgery can have an effect on clitoral position. Um, so looking at native tissue repair versus mesh repair, does that have a, an effect on clitoral morphology and position? And we're excited to publish those findings at, at a certain date. Um, and then uh, providing empirical evidence that there is a relationship between anatomy and function of the clitoris and sexual function. Hopefully that will encourage others to not only look at psychosocial factors as determinants of sexual function outcomes, but also just looking at the anatomy itself. And I feel like especially for gender affirming surgery, seeing how like the uh, reconstruction of the neoclitoris, how that can affect have an effect on sexual function outcomes after surgery. Well, I'm so thrilled. Um, is there anything that you wish uh, you had looked at and didn't get a chance to? Where do you, you know, where where are you most excited to see this research go? I wish we had access to a more diverse patient pool um, for that particular study. It was primarily um, white, uh, middle-aged to elderly women who um, had pelvic organ prolapse. So looking at different um, sexual dysfunction disorders or um, having access to different post-operative images and measurements related to um, like cosmetic surgeries or uh, other general surgeries, I feel like that would have a more direct link between anatomy and surgical outcomes related to sexual function. And, you know, the, the data shows that uh, orgasm with penetration really only happens in about 15% of people. It's kind of the rare uh, way to have an orgasm. And when women tell me they do orgasm from penetration, it's often the certain position they're in. They are on top and they are getting sort of a certain stimulation of that pubic bone. And so I actually would love to correlate this research with those 15% of women who can orgasm orgasm from penetration, do they have a different size and shape of the entire clitoris, not just the glands, but right that whole body? I think there are so many avenues uh, that this research can take, which is why I wanted you so badly uh, to introduce you to, to the world, because there are so many people watching this who say, huh, you know, we don't, we can't even get anyone to read an MRI that talks about the clitoris at all. And here we are looking at the size of the glands, the size of the crura, the, 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 the angle with which it's in the, the pubic bone. So you have really elevated this research 
to the next level. And I think we're going to be talking about this pivotal study probably until the end of time. And so I really do think it is so important that we are finding new ways to study a, a sexual biology, anatomy, physiology, hormones, because as you said, it's not all psychosocial uh, and that there is a biopsychosocial nature to all of this. And so Dr. Bowen, thank you so much for joining our audience today. And where can people find you? On Twitter, LinkedIn, it's just me first and last name Chanel Bowen on all social. So I really appreciate this opportunity to speak with you. It really means the world to me to feel visible within this space. Well, welcome. We are so glad for many more research projects ahead. So everyone, thanks for joining us on Sex Matters. I'm Dr. Rachel Rubin, and y'all have a great day.